Hello, welcome to a podcast on the law and its impact on computing technology and business. This is Brian Gav. I'm a senior member of the IEEE and a partner at the McDermott Will and Emery Law Firm in Boston. The IEEE is presenting this podcast in conjunction with my column that appears each month in Computer Magazine, the flagship publication of the IEEE's Computer Society. That column discusses legal issues relevant to people in the computer hardware, software, networking, and service businesses. In the last podcast, I discussed some questions that readers have raised. This podcast will discuss big data and some privacy-related issues, which is the topic of the June 2014 column in Computer Magazine. Joining me today are my co-authors of the June column, Heather Egan Sussman and Jennifer Geeter. Heather and Jennifer are partners with me at McDermott, Will & Emery. Welcome, Heather and Jennifer. Thanks, Brian. In our column, we talked about the two new reports that the White House uh, released a couple of weeks ago, just on May 1st, uh, concerning big data. Uh, Heather, could you just start with describing what's meant by big data and give us some of the background on these reports and what led up to their release? Sure. Well, let me start with the with the last piece first. So these reports came about at the conclusion of a 90-day review of big data. And the review was called for by President Obama in a January 17, 2014 speech that he was giving addressing signals intelligence. So what do we mean by signals intelligence? It's the type of government surveillance. Um, and w- the one important takeaway from these reports is that it was made clear these reports don't address signals intelligence. What these reports do is address big data um, outside of the signal intelligence context. And so the after giving that speech, President Obama convened Uh, with his counsel, John Podesta, and a working group of senior administrative officials to look at big data and make some policy recommendations going forward. Parallel to that effort, the President's Council, uh, Advisory Council, uh, I'm sorry, Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, that's known as PCAST, uh, also looked at the technology aspects of big data and its privacy implications. And so there were actually two reports released on the same day in May. It led to some confusion as people didn't know how they fit together. But the way that they fit together is that the PCAST report informed from a technology standpoint some of the conclusions and the findings of Mr. Podesta's report, the working group's report. And so we refer to the working group's report as the White House report and the technology group's report, the advisory council's report, as the PCAST report. So what is big data? Big data is described at length in this uh, in the reports, and I think it's tough to come up with one definition, but the way in which I think it's best described is through the three Vs. And those three Vs are volume, variety, and velocity. It's big data that is in such large capacity, moving at, at such fast uh, speed and consisting of such variety that it really doesn't fit into the traditional paradigm of which we have come to know privacy throughout the evolution of our our legal frameworks in society and so ultimately what these what these reports do is describe that big data describe the the uh, legal and policy underpinnings of big data big data and try to move that discussion forward So, Jennifer, we've seen many recent news stories about data breaches that affect millions of people. Target comes to mind as one recent example. One of the reports recommends passing national data breach legislation. What do you think that legislation would include? Um, Would it replace the many state-specific laws that are in place, or would it supplement them? It's a great question, and I think that uh, national breach legislation is something that folks are going to be uh, debating and considering, and there are, as with any new legislation, pros and cons on both sides. Uh, there, There is um, kind of a patchwork currently between states and the federal government of situations in which individuals are entitled to be notified when identifiable information about them uh, is disclosed in ways that, that were not intended. And uh, you can imagine a breach legislation splitting along a number of different fault lines. So, for example, 
in thinking about REACH legislation, you would need to think about what information has to be disclosed in order for it to be a breach. Is it financial information? Is it health information? Is it any identifiable information? Is it some combination of that information? So you would, um, one, one question would be when, what type of information is, is sensitive enough that if it's disclosed in ways that we don't expect, individuals need to be notified? I think a second would be the preemption question that, that you touched on. Is this intended to supplant uh, state breach laws or will states remain the laboratory uh, where these types of issues are explored and federal legislation will become a new floor? How will federal breach legislation uh, interact with the breach rules that are already in effect under HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, which you know many folks know as a, a privacy and security and breach notification rule governing certain types of health information when it's held by health care providers, health plans, and, and the third parties that support providers and plans. So I think there's a lot of different uh, pieces to this. I think you could also imagine damages components, whether there or not there would be a private right of action. Uh, for example, under HIPAA, there is not. Would there be a private right of action under um, federal breach legislation? I think there are, um, it, it could be helpful to the business community to know what is the one-stop shop in the event they have a breach now. Uh, if you have an inadvertent disclosure, you could have breach notification uh, responsibilities in some jurisdictions and not others. On the other hand, um, you know, coming up with a one-size-fits-all piece of legislation might be, might be difficult. I think the last uh, item that, that may be on the minds of, of legislators is guarding against the situation in which the public is notified so frequently of a breach that it just becomes noise. Um, so are there situations in which uh, individuals really do need to be notified so they can take action to protect themselves and, and making sure that those are the ones that, that are brought to the closest attention of the public? So I think there's a lot of moving parts here. Um, there is no full safe system. Uh, you can have a, a wonderful compliance program. You can you, you can take all sorts of security steps, but there's always going to be opportunity for human error. And, of course, there's the bad guys out there, you know, who are going to intentionally uh, try to infiltrate systems. So I think their breaches are, are part of the, the digital landscape, and, and any legislation is trying to mitigate against the risk to consumers from those breaches, but they're unlikely to be eliminated. Thanks. Now, uh, Heather, when you look at these reports, you see that there are uh, – a lot of uh, recommendations that are made. Uh, are there any of those takeaways or any other key takeaways that uh, you think should be highlighted at this point? Sure. I think, you know, stepping back, one of the key takeaways here is that this report, while there's been a lot of negative attention around signals intelligence, particularly in light of the Edward Snowden revelations, and so there's been a lot of real, I think, reluctance among the public to uh, see the value of big data, and it, it raises a lot of concerns. So the reports do a fair job at laying out the case as to why big data in many circumstances actually can provide a public benefit um, and has led to some significant advances in our, you know, historically, looking at big data analytics, for example. Um, and and this, so it makes the case as to why that is something that's beneficial for our society at the outset. And so I think one of the key takeaways is that what these reports ultimately conclude is that they're trying to make the case for the new normal. Let's reframe the discussion in a way that instead of looking at this as a big, scary, threatening um, wave of the future, to acknowledge it as something that can be beneficial. But now, in light of that, let's talk about what's an appropriate legal framework and public policy overlay that's appropriate for going forward. So we call this the new normal of what are you looking at um, going forward So to, to recognize that big data is here to stay, that big data analytics have many benefits, and therefore um, we should 
foster and encourage discussion that tries to still find the benefits but prevent and minimize the harm to consumers. And so one of the ways they propose to do that is by re-examining the traditional notice and consent model of privacy. You know, that's an interesting conclusion that they draw because um, you know, certainly notice and consent have historically been fundamental principles. And in fact, you see notice and consent even appear in the White House's Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights. So on the one hand, they, they address the challenges of the traditional notice and consent model. And at the other, on the other hand, they do point to the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights, which advocates cons uh, consent and notice as still being appropriate uh, for, the, for the privacy discussion. And so trying to find and harmonize some of those tensions going forward are going to be the challenges of, of how to deal with these reports. You know, other key takeaways, I think, and, and Jen touched on one, is this national breach legislation. The, the debate that's happening around that. And one of the components of the breach legislation, too, that I think um, we'll need to look at is whether or not there are minimum information security requirements that are attached to that, similar to what we have here in Massachusetts with the 201 CMR 17. There are a few bills that have been proposed that not only propose a national standard for breach notification, but also minimum security requirements. And so which of these bills will gain traction and which components um, may cause those bills to fail, I think, remains to be seen. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately what we're seeing here with these reports is a reframing of the discussion, trying to figure out the privacy challenges in the big data world and setting the discussion towards figuring out how to tackle those challenges rather than suggesting that big data should just be stopped or go away. Interesting. Interesting. Um, Jen, companies working with big data or providing big data services need to be concerned with, uh, about complying with the regulations that are going to be changing and with new ones coming down the road uh, very frequently. Uh, what's the best way for a company to get a handle on this? Uh, I, I assume a first step would be for a company to have itself audited to see where it stands on compliance. Uh, what do you think, Jen? So I think that privacy and security are parts of a company's stewardship of its data understanding what data it brings in, <clears throat> what data it sends out, and how does it protect the data that's in its keep. And um, for, for this digital economy that you see out there, data is the asset. That's, that's how these companies run. Uh, if they're informatics companies and doing big data analytics, if they're, if they're mobile apps and they, they rely on consumer trust. So in all of these cases, privacy security, data, intellectual property considerations, these pieces of what I would call data stewardship are critically important. They're, they're not on the sidelines. It's not a luxury. Uh, it is absolutely integral to the success of the enterprise, and, and maybe not in the short term. So you may have some luck and think that uh, these, are, these are luxury items, but in the end, they really need to be built into the design and fabric of the business. So I think there's a couple of steps that, that companies can take. The first is to know what regulations already apply. This may seem self-evident, but I think oftentimes there are uh, misunderstandings about the reach of the existing uh, federal and state uh, guidelines and laws, especially at the state level because a company could be operating in many different states. So think about a, a mobile app. You could have uh, customers throughout the country. And there are some really important differences at the state level with respect to data stewardship, privacy, security, minors, a whole host of uh, children, I mean a whole host of issues. So first, know what is your legal landscape as it exists now. I think the second is to, to think about transparency and the way in which you communicate with your customers, which for many of these, co for many of these companies, they are consumer-facing businesses, so what you'd call you know, B2C, not B2B companies. Do you feel like uh, your consumers can read your privacy policies, your terms of use, and understand them? Are you describing data-related terms in ways that will make sense to your average consumer? Are you thinking about a pay-for-data model uh, that 
might allow you to be more restrictive in your downstream uses of data because you're not having to offer your service for free. So thinking about that consumer-facing uh, aspect of your business and, and making sure uh, that you, you take steps to minimize the chance that consumers could feel that the way you conduct business and the way you describe your data practices uh, would, be, would be unfair, would be, uh, would be misleading. I think a third step is to, to really scrutinize the agreements that you enter into with third parties, whether they're advertisers, vendors, downstream data recipients, to make sure that there's a meeting of the minds on what data they'll receive and how they will um, use it. And then I think finally, uh, having your eyes on the future. So one thing that I think really came out of these reports, and Heather touched on it, is that we need to be candid with ourselves about whether or not we have under our current notice and consent model all of the tools we need to both support big data and also protect consumers. And so thinking about what is coming around the bend, what can you be building in from a data architecture perspective, what kinds of uh, data silos and flagging systems you can be building in so that as new guidelines or regulations or best practices emerge, you'll have the tools you need embedded in your product to make those uh, operational. Sometimes that's an assessment or an audit. Sometimes it's through um, business planning. And then to go back periodically, let's say every year or for some businesses even more frequently, and take a look at your data stewardship program, your privacy program, your security program, the design of your business, and make sure that you are, you know, staying current and are consistent with, with commercially reasonable standards. So as a final point, um, Heather, to ensure all of this compliance, um, what about uh, a, a team of people that the company should put together? What, what's, a, what's the usual makeup of some sort of a, a team to ensure that, they're, that the company is complying with all the pertinent regulations? Well, I think there's the potential for both an internally facing team and an externally facing team. And from an internally facing team, you want to convene the stakeholders, those individuals who are going to be able to examine the current state of systems and products to figure out how are the com how is the company or its technologies leveraging big data or data analytics in a way that may be implicated by these changes that we see coming around the bend, as Jen described. And so that internally facing team might include someone from from R&D, would include someone from legal, would include folks who are able, you know, who are in the trenches actually doing the work to figure out um, how to address issues of privacy and protecting consum consumer interests as uh, the technology and the practices of the company evolve. The externally facing team is one that would be looking at, you know, it, do we have a place in this ongoing discussion? Because certainly these reports probably ask more questions than they really answer. It, it, as we said, it is the new normal and trying to right the ship and the pointing it in the correct direction so that we're all sailing towards finding the appropriate privacy paradigm uh, within the big data and data analytics future. But having a team that may be watching for ways to talk to industry groups or trade groups to say, are we um, lobbying or stepping up our efforts? Efforts to, to have our voice heard as to how these potential legal frameworks that we'll be developing, how that might impact us and our business. And so that's an important thing to, to keep watching as this goes forward. Thanks, uh, Heather and Jen, for your views on this. We hope you found this podcast helpful. Please stay tuned for next month's column in Computer Magazine. Until next time, this is Brian Gaff with Heather Egan Sussman and Jennifer Geeter. Please feel free to contact us via email at bgaff at mwe.com or hsussman at mwe.com or jgeter at mwe.com. Thank you.